Welcome to Outfitter Interviews with Safari Club International's Golden Gate Chapter. Today we have Mark Haldane of Zambezi Delta Safaris. Welcome, Mark. Good evening, Steve, and thanks for having me on the, on the show tonight. Oh, it's uh, our, our pleasure. We're just doing whatever we can to try to help out the outfitters who are, have been so severely impacted by um, the COVID uh, restrictions of this last year. So um, basically what I'd like to do is have you just go ahead and introduce yourself and talk about yourself and uh, your organization there. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm Mark Haldane from Zambezi Delta Safaris in Mozambique. Uh, we've been in operation for 25 years. We are uh, operate out of Qatari 11, which is one of the Delta blocks. And we were the first concession to be allocated after the Civil War. Our block is approximately 200,000 hectares, which equates to half a million acres, and is one of the most game-rich areas you'll find in Africa today. Our bread and butter <clears throat> is Cape Buffalo. Uh, we get a quota of 70 Cape Buffalo a year, along with a horse, uh, with a horde of planes game to go with it. Wow, that's uh, quite a few Cape Buffalo uh, to come out of one area. You, but then again, um, half a million acres, 200,000 hectares, um, that's, that's a lot of space. It sure is, Steve. Um, we border the Maramea Buffalo Reserve, which is part of the Delta. Uh, it's a relatively small area, um, probably around about four or 500,000 hectares, the actual uh, Delta itself. And it has a buffalo um, population of about 25,000 buffalo. Wow, that's a lot of, that's a lot of buffalo. Um, what other species do people typically hunt there? Steve, where we're very uh, fortunate is, uh, although our area is half a million acres, it has several distinct ecosystems. It has a uh, swamp floodplain, tropical savanna, sand forest, and miombo woodland. So with this uh, vast variety in habitat, we have a huge variety of plains game as well. Um, we're famous for our huge herds of, of uh, common waterbuck. Uh, sable, one of the highest populations of um, wild unfenced sable in Africa today. And, you know, all, all the, the, uh, the common open plains animals, reedbuck, um, uh, um, uh, hartebeest, we've got crocs in the swamps, hippos, right down to the little Livingston Sunni in the sand forest, blue diker, red diker, the warthogs, and some of the forest antelope like uh, in Yala and Bushbuck. So we are very fortunate with the, the diversity of, of game that we have in this one block. That is an amazing amount of diversity. Do some people come there just to hunt the, uh, the little animals? You know, there's been an increasing demand in the little guys over the years. And yes, we do host several um, safaris nowadays that just come to try and hunt all, all, all the little chaps. We um, currently hold the world record for Livingston Sunni and for uh, the uh, Red Diker. So great numbers and great quality as well. That sounds great. Um, what about timing? What's a good time of year for people to, to come down there? Our season runs from the beginning of April till the end of November. Um, April can be a really wet month. It all depends on what you want to hunt. If you after the little the little forest cars and things like Inyala and Bushbuck, it's probably best to come any time after the end of July, once things have dried up and we've had a bit of leaf drop in the forest. If you after the Plains game in Buffalo, pretty much any time of the year you'll get a, a good selection of what's out there. Okay. Sounds great. What type of uh, hunting do you have? I mean, is it primarily by vehicle, lots of walking, um, you know, horseback, or probably not horseback in Mozambique, but uh, you know, how, do, how is it that people do their hunting there? Steve, it's, it's quite unique again, as with the area. So we use um, ex-military BV-206s. They are, they are an, an um, articulated 
swamp uh, uh, amphibious vehicle. We use those to go into the into the deep swamps where we do a lot of our buffalo hunting. Um, uh, once you're out there and um, you, you're within a mile or so of the buffalo, then it's all done on foot. Um, my guards, uh, PHs, all pride themselves in doing it the right way. So, yes, we use the traditional land cruisers to get around the, the uh, area, but the actual hunting itself, once you're in an area that you're going to hunt, is all done on foot. So you really, you really emphasize fair chase hunting. Absolutely, just the way it should be. You'll find in, in a block like ours, very little has changed over the last 100 years. Um, the advent of the motor vehicle has definitely made it easier to get around, but uh, we make sure that when it comes to, to, to the hunt, we do it as fairly as we possibly can. Okay. Um, I believe I've seen the, um, the BV uh, vehicles that you were talking about on, on one of the shows on TV. They seem to be pretty amazing vehicles. So, um, well, they, 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 they have been a, um, a really good addition for us. We, we're the only guys that operate them in Mozambique. Um, the, the big problem with the swamps, it was very hard to extract the meat from, from the buffalo that we were harvesting. And when you're taking 70 buffalo a year, a year, it's an enormous amount of meat, which all goes back to our local community. So uh, traditionally, we used, the, we used one of the smaller amphibious vehicles, and it, it didn't allow us to extract more than about a quarter of each buffalo. The BV-206s will allow us to extract two full buffalo carcasses every time we go in and out. So every single buffalo that we harvest we, we, we uh, bring all the meat out, which I think in, in conservation and in, uh, working alongside our local villages is, uh, has enormous importance. In a normal, a normal season, not a, not, a, not a corona year, but in a normal season, we distribute upwards of 30 metric tons of fresh meat every hunting season. Holy cow, that is a lot of meat. I know that it's, it's very important for hunting as a whole, as well as for your own particular uh, outfit, that, you know, that the meat be shared with the community so that they they're, have a vested interest in keeping these animals um, you know, growing in population. Absolutely, um, Steve. When we started out there, uh, in the Delta 25 years ago, the game numbers were nowhere near what they were today. So we started off with quite a, um, a strong anti-poaching presence, which has grown every year to where it is today. But uh, along the line, we realized that we couldn't tackle our problems with poaching just with a fist of iron. We had to include our local population and make them feel part of the whole operation. Uh, we campaigned government to give us a community quota over and above our normal hunting quota, which they do every year, primarily uh, water buck and reed buck, which we, we harvest and distribute. And then on top of that, they get a large portion of all the meat from the game that is harvested in the concession. <clears throat> Along with that, we have several community projects. Um, we have a farming project, actually uh, sponsored by one of SCI's chapters, and uh, it does extremely well. We have reduced slash and burn in our area by about 80%. And within a year or two, I believe we'll stop it completely. Um, we plow about, about 250 acres and uh, assist with um, seed and fertilizer. But our local villagers do all the planting and uh, running of the crops themselves and the harvesting. Um, we also have a community beekeeping project. We run 350 halves at the moment, and we are trying to build it up to 1,000 halves in the next two to three years. So we're just trying to give people another option to the bushmeat trade. And um, it's been very successful. Uh, from 25 years ago, when we were viewed as somebody trying to put a stop to their, to their living, we now um, viewed more with smiles and greetings and um, they see us more as partners in, uh, in, in the whole operation. So it's, it's, it's come a long way and it, it's been very positive. Um, perhaps if I can go off at a bit of a tangent, a couple of years ago, we, uh, uh, the, the area 
has had great game virtually in every every aspect, leopards, uh, elephants, buffalo, all the way through. But we were lacking a good seed population of lions. So we went into a, <clears throat> a project with uh, the Cabela's Family Foundation, and we reintroduced 24 wild lions to the block, which was um, the largest reintroduction of wild lions, lions flown over an international border. Uh, but the most stressful thing I've ever done in my entire life but uh, I must say, it's exceeded all expectations. We're a little over two years into the project now, and um, we are now sitting at 64 counted lions, and we have a couple of females with cubs that haven't been able to be counted. So in the day and age where we uh, read of lion, <clears throat> lion habitat being lost all over the continent on, on, a, on a regular basis, it's quite nice that we've been able to increase lion habitat and not just to to our hunting block but to the to the national park next to us and the adjoining concessions and with a with a bit of luck we'll have increased lion habitat by several million acres uh, by the time that the, the, the project is concluded that is pretty amazing you have some uh, very prolific lions to go from uh, from it was it was it twelve uh, up to over sixty four twenty four for twenty four yeah. uh, up to uh, sixty four, and so um, that that is amazing. You've, that's something to really be proud of to be able to take a species which is you know one of those on the brink species and be able to do something like that uh, you know for that species. Well, thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. We've had. Um, a lot of good help along the way, which has really helped us. And uh, it's been an amazing journey. Um, possibly one of the other things that uh, stands us out a little from, from most is we have a full-time wildlife scientist resident in our concession, uh, Willem Briers Lowe. He uh, spends his time tracking the lions, doing wildlife censuses on things like leopards, um, aging every buffalo we shoot. So, you dare and shoot a soft boss buffalo, else Willem will, will have you. Um, and it's, it's just nice to be able to back up all of our decisions with good, solid science and not silly emotions, um, which I think has really been able to put us in the forefront of the, of the conservation of wildlife in Mozambique. Okay. Sounds great. Um, yeah. Getting back to the hunting a little bit, um, you know, what type of weapons do people use there? Rifle, muzzle loader, pistol, archery? What kind of things do you use? Um... Steve, we pretty, we, we pretty much do it all. We have a full-time resident bow guard um, who handles our bow hunting side. We see probably half a dozen handgun hunters every year, but still predominantly most of our hunters are, are the normal rifle hunters. We have seen a few black powder um, hunters over the years, we do battle a little bit with the humidity and the powder, especially during the winter, the winter months. But we have seen them as well, um, and a variety of calibers, as you can imagine. Uh, the little guys, the twenty-two Hornet, um, Craig Boddington brought one out, and uh, it worked so well that's become the standard for for all the little guys since then, and all the way up to the heavy calibers on on. on on uh, on buffalo we don't hunt elephant in our area uh, we do have a, a pretty stable population of about 500 elephants but uh, uh, we chose not to to hunt them as the bulls got um, taken out during the war quite heavily and we don't have um, any really big um, um, mature bulls Okay. Well, since we're talking about weapons, uh, traveling with weapons these days can be uh, more than a little bit of a problem. So uh, do you have uh, weapons there if uh, people would like to rent uh, a gun from you? Yes, Steve, we do. We have a battery of about 20, 20 uh, assorted rifles right the way down from the, the tiny calibers all the way up to uh, 416s. Okay, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, um, I know I've taken my guns before, and I'm starting to look more and more at the idea of, well, maybe it's better to just rent, for, at least for some trips. 
it, 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 uh, it does make it a little easier at times. Mozambique is pretty is still pretty friendly with bringing um, guns in, but it is a, it, it is a long haul over the pond, and I fully understand uh, guys that, that that choose to rent rather than bring their own. So, Mark, could you tell me a little bit about travel arrangements? What is it like getting there? What can people do to have the least amount of problem uh, getting to your facility? Well, Steve, historically, everyone flew to Johannesburg. And then from Johannesburg, there's a daily flight into Beira, where um, they'll catch their charter straight into camp. Um, uh, Recently, Ethiopian Air has... uh, started a flight from Washington to Addis, and then Addis straight into Byra. We've had several guys use it this year in the late season when we finally opened, and it was a huge success. Uh, no overnighting in Johannesburg or anywhere else, just straight through to Addis, a short layover, straight down to Byra. Um, handle firearms without a problem, and uh, so far it looks really good, like it'll take an extra, extra day out of your travel. Excellent. And that was Ethiopia Air? Yes, that's right. Ethiopia Air. Okay. That's a really, really important uh, information. I, I know I've, I've made the trip to Africa a couple of times, and it's, it's always um, a little bit nerve-wracking. So having <laughs> fewer connections and stuff like that it would, would certainly be you know, very welcome. Okay. Uh, what sort of trophies can people expect to get there? I mean, do you have some you know, really good stuff or is it you know, mainly run of the mill? Um, what kind of trophies can people expect? Well, I think let's start with the buffalo first. Um, out of the 70 buffalo that we, that we harvest every year, uh, probably about 20 or 40 inches and up. The rest are more, more often than not around the 37, 38 inch mark. We pride ourselves in taking good, mature, hard boss buffalo and try not to take anything that's younger than eight years old. Uh, last year, um, sorry, in 2019, our average buffalo age was 8.7 years. And like I said, everything with good, solid, hard boss. Um, on the animals that we have exceptional quality, the uh, in Yala, we take a huge amount over 30 inches, as with the um, common waterbuck. Um, Livingston, Sunni, and Red Dyke, like I mentioned earlier, we have the world records on both of them. We have magnificent warthogs. Um, yep, I guess, uh, uh, what else could I go on? The Liechtenstein's heart to be so pretty good. Um, Oraby, we have really mediocre Oraby. We have thousands of reed buck um, on the floodplains, probably our most prolific animal when you're driving on the floodplain. You never, you seldom out of sight of a couple of hundred. Um, we do have some great quality trophies, but you do look through several hundred before you pick out just the, uh, just the right one. I think what really makes our safaris and our hunting special is it's one of those areas you can come on a 10 day hunt, take a buffalo and add, you know, six to 10 good quality uh, planes game animals as well. Wow. That's quite a bit. I guess that uh, from your viewpoint, it's a good thing that uh, my Cape Buffalo was 12 years old and very solid boss. There we go. I like that. That, that, uh, that There's a competition amongst all of my guards every year to see who, who, who shoots the oldest Buffalo. Well, that was my, uh, that's what I told the uh, the PH is that uh, my two requ- my two requirements or at least preferences was something really old and solid boss. If it's a big, great, and uh, it's about forty, just just under forty. Well done. But, uh, well done. Well done. but it's just trophy. And, and I, I had I had a great hunt with that. So um, okay, um, how did you get into guiding? Pretty much, uh, I knew I wanted to do it all, you know, from a kid growing up hunting. Um, I had a lot of freedom growing up in a, on, on a farm as a kid with a lot of, a lot of antelope in the area. Uh, very understanding neighbors who gave me free range over their farms as well. Um, my parents insisted I got an education after school, which I did. And uh, as soon as I was finished, I got my professional hunter's license at 21, 
and uh, started guiding. And pretty much, I wouldn't change a thing if I had to do it all over again. That's great. It's always wonderful that when somebody can find a profession that they truly enjoy and that it's not work at all, it's just their profession. That's it. Yeah. Very blessed in that regard, I must say. Okay. Um, what about, uh, you know, once people have their animal down and, you know, obviously you said that, you know, you're, you re extract all of the meat, which is, which is perfect. Uh, what about trophy handling? What do you do to protect people's trophies? Because that means a lot to a lot of people. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that's, that's one of the most important parts of the safari. So depending where you are, if you, if we go to the swamps after Buffalo, we take skinners with us. So your buffalo is skinned out there and um, brought back to the skinning shed. Um, in the evening, it's cleaned out and uh, salted and, and stored. We have, we have a, a quite a modern skinning shed with um, separate compartments for each client's trophy, so nothing's mixed up. Of course, everything is immediately tanned. Um, nowadays, we use, um, in the old days, all we used was salt. But uh, nowadays, we use a couple of chemicals to disinfect the skins first. We found it far safer, especially with your little animals like the Sunni and Red Dyker that are prone to hair slip if you don't take extra care on them. But the nice thing about our concession is um, it has a good road network and our camp is very central. So when you planes game hunting, you'll probably be back in camp from the furthest corner within two hours if you need be. There's some trophies that are just not worth taking the chance on, especially your spiral horns, um, bushbuck, nyala, eland. Those, those animals need to get back to the skinning shed as soon as possible, skin removed into a salt brine with a chemical to disinfect them to make sure we don't have any hair slips. So absolutely, I agree with you 100%. The trophy preparation is paramount and... Uh, we take it seriously. Perfect. Glad, glad to hear that. I'm sure your clients are too. So what can, what can people do to be best prepared for success when they come in and hunt with you? Steve, I think one of the important things is, is, um, is uh, a good baseline of fitness. Um, doesn't mean to say you're going to run a marathon or anything. We will, we will, of course, um, uh, tailor make any safari to anyone's needs but if you've got a little bit of fitness and you can walk a bit further it's going to make your safari all that much more pleasant the second thing is when you're practicing your shooting don't do it all from the bench by all means make sure your scopes are beautifully set in and you have all the confidence in the world in your rifle and then take a set of shooting sticks preferably the type that you're going to use on, on safari uh, we've all gone over to these steady sticks in, in, in recent years, which are, which are fantastically stable, uh, stable sticks, I think they're called. Um, but practice off the sticks and don't beat yourself to death with your 416 or your 470 or, or one of the heavy caliber rifles. You'll do just as well plinking away with your 22, but use the sticks and um, become confident with them because that's, that's how you're going to, going to make uh, a large majority of your shots. Yeah, well, when I was uh, practicing with my 416 Rigby for, uh, for my buffalo hunt, um, I'm a hand loader. I loaded up a bunch of uh, 350 grain cast bullet loads at about 1,100 feet per second. And let, so it's basically kind of like a 44 Magnum load out of a 10 pound rifle. And let me tell you, that is just a lot of fun to shoot. No, it is. It is. That's you hit the nail on the head. You know, hey. none of us like to think we flinch, but we sure do when we get pounded. And your idea of those downloaded bullets, fantastic. Yeah. It, uh, um, and it was actually turned out to be very important. This was my first time using a Mauser type action. And um, I short stroked it uh, on several occasions and tried to feed both a, a the, the new live round and the empty back into the chamber at the same time, and that just doesn't work. And by yeah, and by using the um, the cast bullet loads, and I, I 
went through at least a hundred rounds, I think, uh, of that. Now, I made sure that I was slamming that thing back and forth every time and I had no troubles when I was on safari. And that was, that was really great. Fantastic. You did the right thing. Man. So um, tell me a little bit about the accommodations. What are the accommodations like there? We have two, two camps. The one camp is an, a traditional East African style tented camp um, with all the modern amenities power, um, hot and cold running water. Each, each uh, tent has its own private bathroom. We have a central dining area. And of course, the heart of every camp, a good fire pit, where all the tails and yarns from the days hunt are worked out. Um, that's our bigger camp. It has 10 uh, tents and the ability to uh, house between 10 and 20 people, depending on if they're sharing or not. Um, our second camp, is the old Portuguese camp that was built out of brick and mortar before the, the Civil War. It was built in the, in the 50s, and we have um, renovated that. And uh, it's a smaller camp. It only has three client chalets. Uh, but once again, all the modern amenities of uh, hot and cold running water and uh, power 24-7. And also fire pit central, central uh, the heart of the... Uh, the camp with a with a big dining area as well. What if a hunter brings a a non hunting uh, companion with them, and you know, you know pays for 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 that privilege? Uh, is what is it? What is there for them to do if they don't want to be trudging through the swamp? Okay, uh, it's funny. Over the years, we've seen more and more families coming on safari, and a lot of non hunters. So. We do have, um, they obviously accompany the hunters for a couple of days. Um, the swamp hunt is one that we normally encourage them not to go on. Um, we have, my camp manageress will normally do a trip to the local village to go and buy, buy fresh produce uh, at least once or twice a week. It's quite an interesting trip to make and go to the local markets, etc. cetera. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier on our, our local scientist, Lord Willem. He takes, uh, he's out tracking some animal virtually every day and he enjoys the company. So if someone wants to go with him and look at the lions that he's busy tracking or monitoring or checking trail cams on his leopards, there's always something, there's always something to do. We also have incredible birding in our area, especially in the late season, sort of uh, um, no, October, November. So if someone's interested in that, we also have incredible birding. We normally see 250 species in, in an average safari. Wow. As a, um, as a photographer myself, in addition to a hunter, that sounds really interesting. And I know that um, at least one of the uh, people in our chapter does a lot of hunting and his wife goes along with him and takes, you know, a really nice picture. It's got nice camera with big long lenses and all that kind of thing sounds like sort of place you would like to go <laughs> it sure does so but you were talking about you know you know possibly um you know going along and looking at the lions for the for the non-hunters and stuff like that especially um brings up an, one, one of my other questions is what do you do to ensure the safety and the reputation of you, your clients when they come to hunt with you uh, first of all, on the safety, um, our, we now, now that we have a pretty high lion population, along with a huge buffalo population and and a healthy elephant one, my guards are all are all armed at all times. Uh, whenever you're out there in the field, you won't see one of my guards or PHs without a rifle. Um, as far as the reputation of our clients goes, well, I think things have changed incredibly from the days when. Everybody was posting dead animals all over social media. Um, funny enough, you look at my brochure, there's not a single dead animal in it from, from beginning to end. So first of all, um, photographs are only taken if a client requests uh, that to happen. We don't have a, we have a policy of no dead animals on social media whatsoever. And photographs, I think in this day and age, are of, of private and we keep it in that way. Very good. That seems to be more important these days with um, so many 
people that are intolerant of other people's viewpoints. Very unfortunate. You know, Steve, it's not just the intolerance. I think that in uh, many cases, although I'm proud to be a hunter and I know what an amazing conservation tool it is, I mean, uh, Katara 11 is living proof where we started off 25 years ago with 1,200 buffalo in the region. Now we're at 25,000. That's all through hunting. So there's no doubt in my mind that what we are doing is the very best we could ever do for conservation. But by putting um, some photographs out there of dead animals, we're taking people that are sitting on the fence and pushing them to the other side. And I think at this, at, at this, in this day and age, we need as many friends out there as possible. And when we can take somebody from a neutral standpoint and let them understand the conservation and the, the goodness that hunting does in Africa, then, then we're winning. And by putting pictures of dead animals out there, we're not doing ourselves any favors. I, I understand completely. It's a very difficult time. So, um, and, you know, Obviously, we're trying to get as many friends as uh, as we as we can. Um, your scientist that you have there on site does he also write uh, scientific papers? He does. He he um, um, he does a monthly report, um, uh, which is a very basic scientific paper. But he's busy on two at the moment: uh, one on leopards and one on on. Um, on lions, and then we have two other scientists that come in from time to time, and they are both busy with uh, papers of their own um, as well on various uh, aspects of our of our of our area. Okay, um, I guess one other question would be: Are you booking cl for clients this year? Um, I am indeed. I'm in quite a fortunate position. We um, rolled over majority of our clients from um, uh, from last year to this year and we had a reasonably good booking uh, bookings for this year as we were so we're pretty full at the moment so our emphasis is going to be more on 2022 I think I have six buffalo left to sell for this year as I stand at the moment okay people you heard that if you want to go um uh, buffalo hunting at uh, Zambezi Delta Safaris. Better book now. You may not have a whole lot of time. And if you want to go this Thank year, you, but Steve. there is next year too. So, you know, keep, keep that in mind. So anyway, um, thank you very much for uh, joining us on this interview today and uh, wish you the best of luck and good hunting. Steve, thank you so much for your time and, uh, Thank you for what you're doing for us as outfitters. It's been a tough time and uh, folks like you guys make it a little easier for us and we appreciate it. Okay, it's, it's our pleasure to help out wherever we can. Thank you, Steve. Have a, have a good day. <laughs>